Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to this one day UVA virtual talk series. My name is Susan Lynch and I'm the Associate Director of Lifetime Learning at the University of Virginia's Office of Engagement. Today, we are joined by three distinguished panelists from the University of Virginia's College and Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. I'll introduce the moderator and then he will introduce the rest of the panelists. Kristen McMillan is a professor in the Corcoran Department of History and Associate Dean for Social Science in the college. His research focuses on the history of epidemic disease and American Indian history. He is the author of three books, including Discovering Tuberculosis, A Global History, 1900 to the Present, and Pandemics. I want to thank Professor McMillan for being here today and moderating the discussion. At the end of the presentation, panelists will answer audience questions submitted before and during the program as time allows. You may enter a question in the webinar Q&A. Please add your name and UVA affiliation. You'll find resources in the webinar chat. Please also note this program is being recorded and will be posted in Lifetime Learning's podcast library. So thank you again for joining us for this Lifetime Learning program. Now I'm gonna turn it over to our moderator, Professor McMillan, to start the program. So Christian, please take it away. Thanks very much, Susan. Thanks uh, so much for organizing the event, inviting me to um, play my small role in introducing our, our featured speakers. Uh, before we begin, I, I want to note that the, or like to note rather, the University of Virginia acknowledges that this uh, that this is Monacan land and the uh, Monacan nation rather, who are the traditional owners of the land and waters upon which the university stands. Um, uh, really, very briefly before I introduce the the, the two speakers, I, I want to note that it really is a great time, in my view, to be involved in, in, in Native American and Indigenous studies at, at UVA. I've, I've been here for 17 years. I arrived in as, as an assistant professor in 2004 and, uh, and looked around and, and realized that I think besides myself and, and Jeff Hantman in anthropology, and Jeff has since retired, we're, we're the only two people teaching on American Indian um, history and archaeology and so forth which only scratches the surface of the indigenous experience. I'm a historian, um, but we had very few people, Jeff and I really being the only, one who, only ones who were studying indigenous studies in any dimension at all. In the 17 years since I've been here, uh, things have changed dramatically, but they've really picked up steam in, in, in my estimation only in the last five to 10 years and now we have more activity in this area, especially in the College of Arts and Sciences that again, at any time since I've been here. Uh, as many of you know, just a couple of examples. Last fall, the Board of Visitors voted to remove the George Rogers Clark statue and contextualize the Jefferson statue. You know, no matter what you may think about um, statues and their, their removal and their, their place in, in public life, it's really a milestone that the University of Virginia is starting to think critically about the place of statues and to think about the history of the, of the, of the university, the history of Virginia in the context of the American Indian experience. It's, that's something that's never been done before. There's also now the largest group of UVA faculty uh, ever assembled teaching on and researching a variety of aspects of Native American and indigenous studies. And of course, you'll hear from two of them today. Um, as I noted, when I got here, it was myself and, and, and Jeff Hantman, hardly enough um, uh, to really form a program and a critical mass of research and teaching. But now we've achieved that. Uh, not to say we couldn't do more and hire more people, but, but we're, we've really made extraordinary progress in this regard. And for that reason, in the fall, we're launching a minor in, in Native American and Indigenous Studies. Um, the first formal program um, where students will be able to get a minor um, in Native American and Indigenous Studies. And in, in time, this may lead to a major. Uh, so there's a lot happening right now. It's all started happening in the last five or so years, maybe 10 years. Um, and our speakers today have been essential in, in much of the progress made over the last couple of years. And they're frankly key to its, its future sustainability. And so it's really my pleasure to introduce both of them. Uh, both hired um, in, in the same year in 2019, both Casey and Sonia arrived in, uh, at the same time and have been transformational in both uh, the Department of Anthropology and American Studies and in the larger collective of faculty working on Native American and Indigenous Studies. So Sonia Alcanini is the David A. Harrison III Professor 
of American archaeology in the college. Sonia is an anthropological archaeologist who specializes in the rise of socio-political complexity in ancient pre-Columbian societies. She's originally from Bolivia. Uh, Sonia has researched the Andes for several decades. She's particularly interested in exploring the Inca Empire's frontiers and the ways these contested spaces affected the dynamics of ancient borderland populations. Uh, Casey, uh, Casey Jernigan, she's assistant professor of both anthropology and American studies in the college. Casey's a, a critical medical anthropologist uh, whose research focuses on obesity and, and related chronic conditions at the intersections of issues related to structural violence, historical trauma, heritage narratives, and meaning making, especially amongst indigenous communities in Oklahoma. She uses collaborative and participatory methods, uh, and her research examines the socio-cultural, economic, political, and historical influences on, of health, while centering tribal citizens' personal stories and meaning making in these processes. It's really a delight to have them both here at the University of Virginia, and it's, it's gonna be great. This will be the first time that I've gotten to hear uh, so much about both of, their, uh, both of their work. I'm really excited to be here. I hope all of you are too. Um, they've been wonderful additions to the faculty. Uh, so I'm gonna be quiet now and, uh, and let Sonia take over. She's gonna talk for a little bit and then Casey will take over and then we'll all rejoin and um, answer as many questions as we possibly can. Thank you, Christian. The Inca was the largest empire in ancient Americas and expanded over most of the Andes. It was known as Tahuantinsuyo, the land of the four quarters. At the center was Cusco, the imperial capital. From there, a road network expanded, linking the capital with the different provinces, as you can see in this map. Along the paved road was a complex system of storage and lodging facilities that marveled the Spanish conquistadors. As you can see, the capital had the shape of a mythical puma. The head was formed by a building known as Sacsayhuaman as you can see here, and a series of palaces and plazas made up the body, and the tail was formed by two rivers. One of the main temples was Gorigancha, the Temple of the Sun, dedicated to the main divinity. On top, the Church of Santo Domingo was later built by the Spanish conquistadors uh, to advertise the Catholic religion and the emerging colonial power. Here you see Machu Picchu, a royal state of the Inca ruler Pachacuti built on the eastern uh, tropical mountains. In fact, the eastern tropics were for Andean polities, invaluable sources of exotic resources, shamanistic knowledge and artistic inspiration. Their inhabitants varied um, had different forms of linguistic and ethnic affiliation, degrees of mobility and sociopolitical hierarchies. Some of the languages comprised the Arawak and Guarani, among many others, as you can see here. Despite this remarkable variability, all of these groups were known as chunchos that came to signify savages of the forest. It was used by the Incas and the Spaniards. You can see a depiction of a chuncho with facial paint and Amazonian animals like parrots and monkeys. One of those groups dwelling on the tropical mountains were the Yunga Callawayas. They spoke Pukina and Arawak, as well as um, uh, Quechua and Machahuyu. They were famous um, herbal healers and traveling shamans considering their extensive knowledge of medicinal plants from the forest. With the Inca conquest, the Callawaya became valued imperial allies, uh, uh, traders and administrators on behalf of the state. As seen in this drawing by indigenous writer Guaman Poma, some also uh, became uh, trusted carriers of the Inca royal litter. They also gained the privilege of using elegant parasols made with colorful, uh, colorful feathers. In this 16th century wooden chest made in Charasani, where I work, 
One sees the alliance of a Kayawaya lord here um, using a bow, which is a traditional weapon of the Amazon. Behind is the Otoronco Amaru, a jaguar snake deity of the Kayawayas, later represented as a dragon due to the Spanish influence. The Inca ruler or his rep uh, representative here uh, is dressed with the royal Unku garment and he is shown using status ear spools. In the second scene, both leaders are depicted exchanging their weapons as symbols of successful alliances. The Kayawaya Lord is dressed in the Inca ways, as you can see here, and the Inca ruler has adopted the Kayawaya divinity. To give you an idea of the Kayawaya's medicinal expertise, you can see here a picture taken in Panama later uh, in the 19th century. They traveled there, hired by the president of this country to cure malaria with quinine. Later, this plant became the basis uh, uh, to treat this disease. Um, and considering their medicinal knowledge, the UNESCO inscribed the Callawayas in the intangible cultural heritage list. They inhabited a range of temperate valleys that reached the Titicaca Basin. These narrow valleys formed a natural corridor that opened into the Amazon along the Eastern frontier. Of great antiquity, this corridor facilitated the flow of exotic resources like coca leaves, quality wood, hallucinogens, and tropical feathers. With the Inca conquest, the region became the province of Callawaya, divided into two halves. There were also important economic uh, shifts brought uh, by the Inca. Our pedestrian survey revealed a number of sites and the massive construction of agrarian terraces and storage facilities along the chain of valleys. There were also significant, um, a significant expansion of pastoralism in the upper Puna, as you can see there, and a large scale migration of non-local Midmacuna uh, working colonies. As a result, there was a dramatic population explosion. Two main Inca centers were established along the Imperial Road, Camata and Catapata. I will focus on the second, Catapata. You can see in this image the location of Catapata and behind the sacred Akamani snow capped mountain. In Kayawaya cosmology, mountains were conceived as alive. They were uh, anthropomorphized beings that dwelt in the landscape. They cared for and fed their human descendants. Mount Kaata was one of such Apu divinities. The two eyes, as you can see here, were formed by two water kocha ponds in the upper Puna, whereas the arms and legs were flowing rivers. No surprise, the Inca center of Kaata was at the mountain's heart and the town of Niño Corín was the sexual organ. It's likely that the Incas established their center there in order to appropriate the sacred geography. Another view of Mount Kaata. It's a beautiful sight. You see the eyes there and the Akamani mountain. As the heart of the mountain, Kaata represented the embodiment of the ruler's power and as a consequence, lavish celebrations were periodically sponsored there to provide with life to those communities dwelling in the sacred mountain. It was conceived that the heart, uh, Sonko in Quechua, brought consciousness, memory, and reasoning. This is an important concept that we must keep in mind. These are some views of the Inca architecture at the site including a sacred Ushinu rock 
in one of the plazas. Our excavations revealed a long occupational sequence. This included the early Inca period, roughly contemporaneous with the reign of Pachacuti ruler. The Middle Inca during the time of Tupac Inca Yupanqui ruler and the late Inca early colonial period, which encompassed the reign of Huayna Capac and the later downfall of the empire. In the early Inca period, Cata was small. Excavations in platform nine revealed the foundations of three aligned rooms used for uh, specialized activities. This may have included uh, metal processing. The trash areas were limited in distribution and a canal north fed a large water reservoir. In the middle, in the following middle Inca period, the architecture and range of activities expanded in scale. This included metal smelting as seen in the presence of welding tubular holes in room nine. They were from sopletes, which were blowing pipes used to melt gold. The famous Carabaya gold mines were closed and Cayahuayas were known to have exploited such resources. Similar remains were found at Curamba, another important gold processing center in Peru. This, this illustration made by Benzoni shows the ways in which such blowing pipes were used in smelting. To the north was an elite residential compound. There, the residents enjoyed access to status metal ornaments and sponsored lavish commensal celebrations. These are examples of the status metal ornaments enjoyed by the residents in Catapata, which included tiny bells attached to the garments, rings, facial tweezers, and ceremonial knives. In the final period, the site was uh, the progressively abandoned and indigenous populations were moved to a lower Spanish reduction town. Considering the topic of this presentation, I will focus on the nature, on the nature of commensal celebrations promoted by the Inca state at the heart of the mountain. I will analyze the kinds of foods utilized, the cuisine and etiquette, as well as the associated material culture. Animals were important sources of food, but also of artistic inspiration. They were widely depicted in Cayahuaya textile garments, as can, see be, uh, as can be seen in this image. Faunal remains revealed the consumption of camelids, deer, and other mammals in Cata, and in less degree, guinea pigs, birds, and fish. From those, camelids were popular, and it's likely that domesticated llamas and alpacas were raised by Aymara pastoralists in the upper Puna pastures. There laid a complex system of cocha water reservoirs. We calculated the amount of meat packages based on uh, different utility indexes. Instead of providing with absolute estimates, this allowed us to understand the variability in meat access over time. And the results revealed a steady increase in camelid meat. Uh, and this trend, uh, as you can see in the graph, changed in the last period as the site was abandoned. The diversity of meat packs also suggests that the animals were brought from the upper Puna to be slaughtered nearby. Along with lavish quantities of meat in the periodic banquets, the wide ubiquity distribution of corn reveals its economic importance. Grown locally on the lower valley flanks, maize may have been used in stews and more importantly, in brewing chicha corn beer. It was followed by quinoa. Um, here you see the distribution and the dominance, in fact, of uh, Z maize. Uh, 
Okay, so this was followed by quinoa and other tubers like potatoes and oca. Although quinoa could be grown locally, it's likely that the different tubers were grown in the upper Puna. From the lower tropics flowed uh, all kinds of ecucurbitaceas like pumpkins and peppers, and it's likely that coca leaves, tobacco, and hallucinogenic plants were brought by Yunga Chunchus. This reveals not only a vertical economy aimed at diversifying resources from different altitudes, but also the need to integrate distinct ethnic groups under the Inca imperial umbrella. Echoing the diversity of foods, the serving vessels were also varied. Decorated bowls and plates were abundant, but also were aribaloids and small jars for chicha beer libation. Many serving uh, vessels were decorated in the taraco and urcosuyo polychrome styles, both common in the Titicaca Basin. They depicted colorful zoomorphic figures and plants. To conclude, this study has shown that Inca state commensalism was a critical component in the range of activities at the site. It served to integrate populations of distinct ethnic origins distributed along the um, ecological spectrum through a common idiom of reciprocity and redistribution. Simultaneously, these events served to reinforce social differences um, and whether um, these individuals were Inca of origins or Incanized Kayawaya elites, the center residents played a key role in the regional political economy. Placed in the mountain's heart, the center materialized the bodily geopolitics of Inca power. Ontologically, we are reminded that the Sonko, the heart, was fundamental in the creation and understanding of a new social reality and in the construction of shared memories inscribed in the landscape. And just to finish, let me just show you uh, some examples here uh, um, on how ethnographic research has abundantly documented how Andeans envisioned their landscape as animated with prominent mountains being sacred. Uh, these Apu mountains had personalities, aspirations, rivals, as well as a network of kings and allies that also included humans. Here I show you the feminine silver mountain of Potosí, Bolivia, embodying the Virgin Mary. You see here Dr. Sahama, a volcano also in Bolivia. He's attributed with um, a curative powers. Below a shrine, uh, you see um, in the shrine, you see his uh, stony phallus where uh, fertility rituals take place. In this context, the act of feeding and eating with Mount Kata at its sacred center acquires a critical importance. Through such a collective celebrations, life was ensured, including the promise of successful advances into the Eastern tropics. Uh, thank you. And uh, the following um, a presenter will be Casey. Thank you, Sonia. Um, I'm honored to be here today among such uh, outstanding panelists. Christian, Sonia, thank you. Thank you, Susan um, and Ashley and UVA Lifetime Learning for organizing this and for inviting me to share some of my work. And I'm also grateful to those of you who are joining us this afternoon. When I share some of my work with my students, I always like to first ask them, um, what comes to mind when you think about Native American food? So how many, how many Native foods or meals can you list? And, and they often look at me a little bit strangely or with blank faces. And some will venture a guess and say squash or corn. Um, I've had a few say fry bread, but mostly they, they really can't think of anything 
And so before I list out foods for them, I like to share a short but foundational story. And I'm gonna do that with you all today as well. Um, as our knowledge holders remind us, stories are living. They grow, they develop, they can change, not necessarily in their meanings and the messages that they aim to convey, but in the details. They're shaped by land, they're shaped by the person telling the story. They're even shaped by the purpose in the moment of the storytelling. So today I am sharing a version of a Chata story as I heard it. And as, uh, as you listen, I ask you to think about which food this, this story is referencing and what is the, the point of this story? What's the purpose? What kind of work does it do? Okay, so a long, long time ago, two hunters became lost and they were cold and hungry and they only had one small tukfi, a rabbit, to cook. And so as they watched the rabbit cook over the campfire, they heard what sounded like a woman crying and they rushed through the woods to find a young woman, so beautiful, standing on this mound. Um, she, she, the, the moonlight, the moon was lighting, glow, making her look as if she were glowing. So they approached her and they asked her, are you okay? Why are you crying? What are you doing here alone? How can we help you? And she explained to them that she was the daughter of Hashtali, the, the sun father and the moon mother. And while she was on an errand for them, she'd run out of food and she was very, very weak and she couldn't continue her, her journey, her errand. And so these two hunters offered her some of their small rabbit she took a single bite and then thanked them, told them that uh, she would remember their kindness and that they should return to the same spot tomorrow morning. And then she disappeared. And so these hunters were surprised and a little confused, but they went on about with their evening. And in the morning when they woke up, they, found, they, they, they returned back to the mound and they found that it was covered in a strange plant a very tall green plant with long leaves, um, with long fruits. And they took one of the fruits and they peeled back the green layers and they, they saw what looked like small little seeds set in neat rows. And they took a bite and they realized, ah, this is probably gonna taste better cooked. So they took the rest home with them, shared it with their families, planted it. And in the fall, they had a crop of this new food that they called tanti. And shortly after that, Chala families planted tanchi every spring. They harvested it in the fall and they learned to cook this in dozens of different ways. And so by now you may have guessed that tanchi is maize or corn, right? And that this, the purpose of the story is, um, it's an origin story. It, it conveys very important messages. It positions corn as a gift given to Chatas for their kindness from an other than human relative. And as a gift, Tanchi is to be nurtured, respected, cared for, tended to, shared with others. And the story not only shows us how important Tanchi is to Chata foodways, right? To have an origin story illustrates the importance of corn and its centrality to uh, Chata foodways but it's also a story about reciprocity and it teaches um, Chakta values of giving and receiving, right? So if Chaktas take care of the Tanchi, the Tanchi will take care of Chaktas. But when people think of native foods today, they don't necessarily call on Tanchi or the other um, dozens of, of multiple preparations that are made from it, like Banaha here you see in the, on the slide. And even if they do think of corn, it's often thought of in um, an isolated existence. It's stories and meanings forgotten. It carries none of the values of reciprocity, re reciprocal caring, a relationship. It's just corn, a product, not a living being and certainly not a plant relative. So in this really short talk, I'm gonna highlight uh, how, how that came to be, how we either know nothing of native foods or how um, fry bread perhaps is the only native food that, that you might've heard of and how systematic disenfranchisement has come to make invisible these relations with, with our plant relatives, with plant beings. So I first 
like to explain my own positionality and how this project began. I am a citizen of the Tukta Nation, and when I started grad school, I, I began with ideas and personal interests around health outcomes and historical trauma because my own grandmothers were forced to attend Shalako, which is an Indian boarding school in Oklahoma, that like all the other boarding school, Indian boarding schools and residential schools was, was set up to assimilate indigenous peoples into mainstream white American society. And they were punished for not assimilating. So for example, for speaking Chata Anumpa, their, their indigenous languages. And my grandma used to tell me and my sister's stories about some of the really difficult experiences that uh, they had related to these assimilation practices that carried forward through generations. So I began this research project interested in understanding the, the linkages between historical trauma and its manifestation in contemporary health outcomes. So while my, my personal family history inspired um, my interests in an in anthropological understanding of historical trauma. I collaborated with tribal citizens in Oklahoma to narrow the focus uh, of, of that health outcome to obesity, diabetes, and related conditions like heart disease and so on. And uh, folks were interested in, in large bodies and obesity, not simply because they had been told repeatedly, and I'm using scare quotes here, how dangerous or risky fat bodies are, but because they were concerned about the ways in which fat bodies seemed to serve as markers for Indianness, as social connectors to other Indians. And this was in contrast to um, thin bodies, which signified whiteness to them, right? But more, um, they linked obesity with commodity foods or participation in the food distribution program. So at this point, you might be thinking, it might be tempting to dismiss uh, these interlocutors as simply fat or unhealthy or poor or even victims. But in this research, both immense suffering and incredible resistance seep through their personal stories and their, their narratives reveal forms of survivance of, of humor and brilliance. And so I won't go into too much detail because I don't have enough time, but um, in terms of methods, this was a mixed methods research that included ethnography, uh, food-centered life history interviews and quantitative surveys for about 50 women living in the Choctaw Nation. And we found that uh, rather than simply stating that obesity is a marker of Indianness, they identified this trifecta of struggle, of poverty and discrimination as markers of Indianness. And they understand fat bodies as the physical manifestation and the embodiment of those experiences. And these are experiences which include poor food environments, um, continued dependence on the government for commodity foods, as well as loss of land, language, traditional cultural expressions, knowledges, and stories. Um, they even have a creative name for overweight bodies, kamadbad, which refers to a large body that comes from eating commodity foods that are high in fat and calories. And that was the title of one of part of the title of this talk. So how did this come to be? Um, just briefly, uh, before European contact, Chara foodways were diverse and unique to the local ecosystems of our ancestral lands, which are located in the southeast parts of what are currently known as Mississippi and Alabama. And our subsistence included agriculture, um, hunting, gathering, uh, which changed seasonally. And so our diets, our original diets consisted of corn, squash, deer, fish, as well as wild fruit with corn and deer, um, really the center of both nutrition and ceremony. So our ancestors would regularly perform a green corn dance to both honor and purify the plant and relations with the plant. And so these foodways were deeply intertwined with cultural practices that protected against crop failures and unsuccessful hunting for sure, but that also 
underpinned Chata gift economies, the reciprocity through networks of kinship and, and collective redistribution of foods and goods. So as it comes through in the, the corn woman story that I shared, the reciprocity caretaking of living beings, both human and other than humans, that's a central tenet of Chata ways of being in the world. Um, we know that colonization is not only an attack on peoples and their lands, it is also an attack on cosmologies. So Chattas were the first tribe to be forcibly removed to Indian territory or what you would probably know as Oklahoma uh, in the early 1830s. And they were supplied with rations to survive the 500 or so mile walk that has been called the Trail of Tears because about a third of Choctaws died from disease and starvation and the freezing weather. Um, rations were uh, also promised for an additional year after resettlement, but government mismanagement, bad weather and basic logistics complicated this to phrase it generously. Um, you can see on this slide uh, an example of the kinds of rations that were provided to tribes. And these were intended to prevent starvation rather than emphasize nutrition. So they were heavily processed and preserved so as to be able to endure long journeys to their destinations. And looking at these foods and goods um, that were distributed to uh, the reservations in Oklahoma really allows us to see the bureaucratic standardization and routinization of food by the Office of Indian Affairs, which at the time was located in the Department of War. But it, it lets us see, though, how the US government has played a significant role in shaping native food environments. So it took about 10 to 15 years for Chattas to establish reliable subsistence systems again, which supported the majority of food and income for most Chattas. And by about 1959, the number of farms had declined by nearly 60% and the nation saw uh, nearly complete land alienation. And the roots of this second land alienation, of course, can be traced to the allotment era in the late 1800s, which ushered in the Dawes Commission that essentially ended collective land ownership in favor of private land holdings that were allotted to um, individual enrolled tribal members. And this shift to end collectivization created perfect conditions for forced sales of land and land exchange um, that happened during times of hardship. But even before all of that, Choctaws were already experiencing land privatization by non Choctaws who violated existing treaties through um, illegal fencing of tribal lands, illegal land title claims, and the local legal systems that really failed to uphold collective land rights. So today, um, the Choctaw Nation is, is home to some of the poorest communities in the country with uh, some counties reporting near 50% poverty rate. And as such, there are a lot of people who are suffering the incumbent health and social problems of endemic poverty, including high rates of obesity and diabetes. And people still continue to depend on assistance from the US government for food. So today, the US Department of Agriculture, the USDA, has a program called the Food Distribution Program on Indian Reservations, the FDPIR. And it supplies um, a monthly food package program to about almost 300 tribes. And this program began as an alternative to the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program or SNAP or what you might think of um, when you think of food stamps. And it was created because many reservations did not and some still do not have grocery stores nearby or if there was a grocery store nearby, the prices were extremely high. Uh, it, all of this started as part of Johnson's War on Poverty and by the early 1970s, Indian communities were consuming mostly government provided commodities. And this pattern largely continues today with about 60% of rural and reservation Indians and 20% of urban Indians relying on commodity foods as their primary food source. And these are, these are foods that are intended to be supplementary, not primary. Uh, within the Choctaw Nation, about 5,500 households per month participate in commodity foods. 
program and it, it comes out to about 85 pounds per food per family member per month. And you can see the types of foods that are offered in the program, they, all different types of canned, dehydrated or other forms of shelf stable foods. Um, today though, lots of tribes, including the Choctaw Nation have made concerted efforts to include fresh fruits and vegetables and um, frozen meats like chicken and beef and occasionally bison. Um, but it's, it's really not difficult to see the resemblances to the early rations of the 1800s and that the bulk of the commodity foods today are heavily, heavily preserved, um, shelf stable, and they have a low nutritional value and they continue to be supplied by the government. Um, they've also forced uh, the adoption of new foods and practices. And um, one example is, is fry bread, which I talked about a little bit. Um, the origin of fry bread is uh, traced to um, the rations that were supplied to the Diné of the Navajo Nation, who also experienced their own forced removal. And Diné women are credited with creatively combining rations to make fry bread. But fry bread status as Indian food is deeply conflicted. Um, in 2005, uh, Cheyenne and Muscogee Creek activist Susan Harjo wrote an article for Indian Country Today, which really challenged fry bread status as, quote, emblematic of the long trails from home and freedom to confinement and rations. And this started what is known as the great fry bread debate. And in this debate, there are two camps, the proponents of fry bread who claim it is a symbol of native pride and unity. It connects us, uh, uh, our shared adversity, and it really reflects Indian history of both perseverance and pain. It's been called the story of our survival by Sherman Alexie. And then in the other camp, we've got the opponents who link it with negative health outcomes, particularly in locations where it is a food staple. And they also note um, that fry bread originates in, in oppression, in violence. And um, the, there are multiple stereotypes that it reproduces. So referring to the high calories and fat, Harjo identified it as, quote, the connecting dot between healthy children and obesity, hypertension, diabetes, dialysis, blindness, amputations, and slow death. So changes in food and food systems have all sorts of social repercussions uh, because of the meanings that are attached to food and food ways. And so commodity foods have come to symbolize tribal life or life on the res. And they've been, they were originally identified or known as poor food and that has morphed into Indian food and have become the basis of jokes, songs, um, other sorts of cultural expressions I put here on this slide that symbolize a, a particular experience of foods food insecurity. But instead of signifying cultural extinction, th this, the demise of traditional food ways is, is recognized as a specific experience that informs what it means to be Indian today while living within a colonial infrastructure in which um, Kim Talbert, who's a Lakota scholar, calls, notes, it's, an, it's a colonial infrastructure in which we must survive, but which was forced onto us as the only alternative to death. So I know I'm running out of time, but I hope that I've made it clear that the use of the term commodbot is, is more than a public and social or even humorous marker for Indianness. It's really speaking to a deeper social commentary or analysis of shifting food sovereignty linking it with the production of large bodies at risk and efforts to improve the situation, really need to understand these discourses of identity and Indianness and how these, these issues are reflective of a larger history of loss of food sovereignty and living within contemporary colonial 
infrastructure. So thank you so much. Um, so we have uh, plenty of time now for you know, 10 minutes or so, I think, for questions and answers. We'd love to um, we'd love to get the audience's questions. I, I do see one in the chat that, that, that maybe is relatively simple to answer. And it, Sonia, maybe it's best left to you. It's not about the Inca, but uh, uh, I'm curious about whether Maya civilization emigrated north and south. Uh, do you have anything you might want to say about that, just briefly, perhaps? Sure. Uh, yeah, the Mayas uh, have a long sequence of occupation in Mesoamerica, and they spread uh, in Belize, Guatemala, uh, the part of Mexico, and so on. And uh, we know that they uh, kept some links and different forms of interaction with the basin of Mexico. <clears throat> They interacted with the uh, state of uh, uh, Teotihuacan, more or less by the 800 AD, and uh, and they were part of a large exchange network that went all the way up to North America. In fact, so uh, all of these states, Maya, you know, uh, states, Teotihuacan, and all of these polities in North America had this network of interaction. Uh, we know that because um, in these different Anazazi, you know, uh, Pueblo sites, there are uh, a tropical feathers, from example, uh, for example, mm -hmm. of the Maya area. So you can see the, you know, exchange of interaction north and uh, south, maybe uh, not that much, but we know that the Incas, for example, sent uh, um, sort of like ships, uh, rafts. They sent rafts all the way up to uh, um, Ecuador and even farther. Uh, so you see different forms of interaction. Thanks, Sonia. I, years ago, um, Sonia, this might be of minor interest anyway, uh, Steve Plog, who, who held the Harrison chair immediately before you. I used to invite him to my class every year to lecture on Anasazi. And, and he would in fact discuss the, you know, the, the, the trade links with the, the far south, so to speak, and, and the, the presence of tropical bird feathers and so forth. It was really fascinating. So thanks for answering. Well, with the, the question, the Q&A is starting to populate now. And let me see if I can uh, uh, um, throw some questions to both of you. Uh, Casey, uh, have there been any developments in, in Choctaw cuisine to react to quote unquote Kamad Bad? Um, if so, how are those seen by the community? And then maybe combining it with, you know, how are Choctaw people now educating um, citizens on, on healthy eating? Yeah, thanks for those questions. Um, so that a lot is happening and it may seem like it's new, but it's not. It's important to understand that food sovereignty initiatives and resistance to um, colonial infrastructure like Kamad Bad, um, it has, has been going on since contact. And so um, there's always been people in the community and, and resisting this and remembering ways and passing them forward to youth to carry on. So um, the, the tribe has done a lot of work lately uh, in, 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 I guess, refocusing on not just food, but the whole, uh, taking a holistic approach to this, right? So they've set up next to the food distribution centers, they've set up gardens. And with it, where the centers are located, where you pick up your food, there's also um, uh, an elder center, right? It's the community center. And so there, these are seen as sort of one-stop shops. You've got the community center, you've got um, the, the food distribution site, and then you've got like the Head Start programs all on this sort of same campus with the garden growing. And so they've been working to have elders and youth because elders visit the community center weekly for lunches and things to work together in the garden. So that's something that had just started taking off when I began this research. 
Um, and there's the Chata Foundation, which is um, part of the, it's a private foundation, it's part of the Chata Nation that has been working on assessing uh, food insecurity and food sovereignty throughout the nation. Uh, so there's a lot happening and people, you know, I think for me, what stands out is these values of reciprocity. So even when commodity food is the only food that you have, you still see the ways that people care for each other through using commodity foods, right? By sharing it with family. I grew up eating commodity foods myself that were shared with my family um, from my cousin, my dad's cousin who was in the Creek Nation because we lived within Tulsa and didn't have access to the Choctaw Nation commodity foods. So in, in those ways, the reciprocity and the, the values are still constantly being remembered and, and, and acted and embodied. Thanks, Casey. Uh, if it looks like I'm not paying attention, I am paying attention. I'm just trying to read the questions and listen at the same time. Uh, I promise I'm not just checking email or something obnoxious like that. Uh, Sonia, there was a question for you. Uh, yeah, so Sonia, I, I, we have a question um, about your thoughts on the current situation of food and, and culture in Bolivia, presumably indigenous culture and, and food in Bolivia. Uh, is it at risk? Has it successfully survived? You know, where does it stand today? Maybe that's an opportunity just to talk about the ways sure. in which you know, food and so forth, food culture has changed over the years. Uh, thank you for the question. I'm an archaeologist, so I focused uh, on the past, but um, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, some of these practices in the present. If you saw, if you saw in some of the slides, I showed you these uh, agrarian uh, terraces that the Incas had built in a large scale. And you saw a picture where um, entire valleys are literally uh, modified um, with these ancient agrarian systems. And the Incas were um, magnificent at that. They changed entire landscapes. They built canals, roads, and so on. So indigenous groups uh, in the Cariahualla region at this point they are still using uh, some of the terraces. So once you build, and I was thinking about uh, that as well when Casey was uh, talking, uh, all of these uh, indigenous groups in the Americas have built not only uh, sites, you know, uh, temples, uh, buildings, but they had, you know, this deep knowledge on how to manage efficiently all of their landscape. Uh, in the Andes, you see some of these uh, terraces, you saw some of these water ponds. Some of those are not natural. Those are man-made. And, and the Incas, and even before they modified, they built you know, uh, these uh, ponds, literally ponds to catch water. So um, all of these systems are still in use. Uh, some of the terraces in some sections may not, but uh, all of these Quechua groups uh, are still using it. Uh, uh, and they grow their uh, corn in the lower, uh, in the upper uh, section, they grow potatoes. In the lower uh, portion, they still grow coca leaves. So uh, along the altitudinal spectrum, because each area in the Andes has a different ecology and environment and climate. Uh, just by growing plants in the altitude, in you know, in these high mountains of the uh, of the Andes, you can have a variety of uh, plants that can you know supplement your diet. So all of these groups are still are still doing that. Uh, of course, um, that's going to change from region to region. In some areas, uh, because of migration into the cities. Uh, some groups, uh, um, they just want to go to the cities because they are looking for cash, right. uh, you know, which is normal. But I think, you know, this transfer, you know, of knowledge uh, is still there. Thank you. I, we have a really limited amount of time left. There's a ton of questions, but I, I'm going to try and uh, uh, combine a couple that are just quite broad that might allow you both maybe one minute each to to, to 
uh, uh, to make some final comments. So one one uh, participant or or, or uh, yeah wants to know is if there's an international movement or awareness, uh, and are people across you know countries and across cultures. Uh, who are worried about loss of food and food culture, uh, heritage, and so forth, you know, across the globe? Is this a global um, phenomenon? So, in a way, you know, Casey, could some of what you're discussing be generalized in just some broad ways across the the, the planet? And in a related way, Sonia, um, and again, I'm sorry, these are big questions, but maybe just brief answers. Um, you know, how have the the, the recent um, popularity of, of of foods such as you know quinoa uh, and agribusiness of corn affected indigenous uh, food production, particularly in places in the Andes where you know quinoa is from and so forth. So both questions about how this this the, the global dimensions of some of the things you're talking about. Okay, so I'll be very brief. I think this is such Sorry. an important question, and yeah. it it definitely deserves more time. But I would say that um, indigenous peoples recognize seeds as kin, as relatives. And so um, there are some of the most beautiful um, poignant stories of, of people having saved seeds through generations and generations in old tin coffee cans. And finally, just now being able to bring them forward and share them confidently with community members to grow these heritage crops that have been saved. Um, but that too, there's always debate. Whenever there's something going on, somebody's always debating it. So the Cherokee Nation, for example, um, included some heritage seeds in the vault, right? The vault, the apocalypse vault of all the seeds, the seed, the vault, the bank, right? The seed bank. And that the controversy was, how can you put those in the vault when these are our relatives? Um, you know, they, they're meant to grow in the ground and adapt and evolve with the land. So there's, there's always debate, but I think that um, seed saving is something that's really important and interesting to kind of look at globally. And I'll, I'll pass you. it on to Sonia now. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, that's a really interesting question, a Christian. Uh, there have been different projects. I can take any the, credit for it. <laughs> uh, there are different projects in the Andes in trying to uh, promote uh, the production of all of these, you know, um, uh, plants, quinoa, um, uh, the potatoes and so on at a large scale. Uh, indigenous groups in the Andes, uh, uh, they can produce much more. The problem is the market. And uh, why they would produce more if, if the prices are low. So uh, some groups are trying to um, uh, export quinoa, for example. Quinoa, you know, uh, is being so successful. Now they are, you know, starting to grow quinoa. They want to export uh, coca as well, but for other ends, as you know, um, we have 500 types of uh, potatoes, maybe more, you know, how many we have in the US? I don't know, but there is a wealth of, you know, products that could be uh, exported. They want to do yeah. it. So the opportunity is there. Thank you. Thanks so much to both of you. And uh, Susan, we had so many great questions and so much interest that we've now magically, but unsurprisingly, run out of time. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you so much uh, to each of our faculty members, Christian, Sonia, and Casey, um, for sharing your time and your expertise with us this afternoon. I, I know that I learned a lot during this hour, and I have lots of homework to do on my own to learn some more. So thank you so, so much. I really appreciate it. So I want to take a moment Thanks. and bring some upcoming lifetime learning programs to your attention. Uh, we invite you to join us for any or all five of our virtual events during our extended Jefferson Symposium in June. The program is entitled Jefferson's West, Lewis, Clark, and Native Americans. Descriptions for each of these programs and the featured speakers can be found on the Lifetime Learning website. Also, check out our Lifetime Learning Podcast Library and our UVA Speaks podcast series to watch and listen to our expert UVA faculty. You can find all of our Lifetime Learning events and online resources 
at alumni.virginia.edu backslash learn. In the meantime, please stay safe and be well. We are gonna keep the program information on the screen for a few moments so you can jot down some information if you'd like. But for now, I wanna thank you for being with us and I hope you enjoy your rest of your day. Thank you so much.